Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I just wanted to point out that um, the this is that forms icon. There's already a poll that is active. So if you are a licensed pesticide applicator looking for credits, then you'll want to um, go ahead and open that form and uh, fill in that first question, which has already been launched. There'll be four other questions uh, throughout the meeting, if we do it right. So I'm just going to give a brief update on the distribution of Emerald Ash Borer in Maine, as well as the regulations. And I'll start that by um, really thanking folks who did participate in our surveys for their help. Um, we had a number of surveys for Emerald Ash Borer this summer, as we do every summer. They included a survey using the purple prism traps that most people are now familiar with because we've been using them for quite a while. Also, uh, green funnel traps, and those were run by volunteers. We really appreciate that effort because those traps need to be babysat. They need to be visited every every two weeks and the, the uh, collections picked up. We also have a uh, Cerceris wasp survey that happens every year that's using a um, native wasp species that will uh, go after metallic wood boring beetles, including emerald ash borer, if it is in the area. And we also had visual surveys and finally trap tree surveys. And trap tree surveys, again, that's a place where we have a ton of volunteers and we really do appreciate those efforts because it, it really amplifies what we'd be able to do for looking for emerald ash borer if we were doing it on our own. We lost your screen there, Allison. I think you, you're you sharing did. something different now. Yeah. What am I what am I sharing now? Uh, how do you want to join <laughs> our your team's meeting? Really? I yeah. don't even see that anywhere on my screen. <laughs> it it looks like Caleb uh, Hemphill has accidentally started sharing his screen. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering as well. That's what it says. Oh, okay. That's what I So see. let me go back. You need to take over. You see in my screen again? Yes, we do. All right. Well, that's, that's okay, because I, I wasn't uh, doing much with my screen at that point, um, except for uh, just showing this map. And so this this map reflects the positives that we have up, up until um, the end of November um, for all those surveys that I just described. And what we had was we had a number of detections within the regulated area that occurred throughout that summer months, most recently, we had detections um, in two trap trees, one in Falmouth, which is down here in southern Maine, and the other one in Frenchville, which is up here in northern Maine. Um, so we have had two positives from the trap tree. Uh, we also had some positives from the green funnel traps, including in the towns of Gorham and Buxton. And we have not on this map at this point, but a presumptive positive in Lovell as well. It's been identified as emerald ash borer, and we're going to send it off for confirmation just because it is um, the first insect that we've had to send off to the federal cooperators for confirmation in the Oxford County area. So that's just north of the positive here. And then as far as regulations, I think many of you were on the call that we had in um, August when we talked about <clears throat> the Emerald Ash Borer Emergency Order Area which is in uh, Southern Oxford County. Excuse me, and it's outlined in blue on this map. Um, this was put into place in order to accommodate this detection here in Bridgeton that had happened through visual surveys earlier in the summer. And we still have a quarantine both in Southern Maine and in Northern Maine. And that quarantine restricts the movement of ash, um, including hardwood firewood and uh, you know logs and branches those types of things it does not restrict the movement of chips however we still do recommend that chips are kept in a uh, in a within a close distance of where they're harvested even though they're no longer regulated that would be the best management practices and I wanted to point out that we have um, the quarantine information available on our website, which is maine.gov eab. 
It's hosted by the Cooperative Ag Pest Survey, and the quarantine rules are front and center there. But you can also find them, um, including many other details, in this drop down as well. So that's another place where you can find quarantine information. And among the highlights on the website that I wanted to share with folks is um, this final drop down as well caring for ash and managing forests. It has, among other things, the best management practices for handling ash within the regulated area, as well as guidance for landowners, managers, solid waste handlers, and others. So if you haven't had an opportunity to check out our website, I recommend that you do. And at the top of the page, if you haven't already, you can sign up to receive the Emerald Ash Borer updates. That's what I have, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point. All right, thank you, Allison. I, I've noticed that the, the poll isn't open or you can't get to it. I don't know. I know this is our first time trying to do this, so it's maybe not working. You're muted, Allison. You don't see, please choose all that apply up at the top of the screen. It says it's live. I'm a town manager, other town employee, presenter. I don't see anything. Under, if you click the, the polls icon. Right, all I see is polls and an X. Interesting. <laughs> I see it, Allison, under the polls, yeah, the polls tab up at the, you know, next to the um, three dots. I'm wondering if it's only available to your group. Hmm. Kenny sees it. I'm seeing a lot of Forest Service people. Joanne Garten is uh, not within our group, so Joe Anderson can see it. So, all well, right. <laughs> okay. Sarah O'Donnell does not see it. Hopefully, it's working for most that need to see it. But so the the first poll just asks you to identify your role, and it's. Uh, town manager, other town employee, presenter, licensed pesticide applicator, specifically to try to identify those who need uh, credits for the licensed pesticide applicator. Um, so we'll try to read the questions after the other polls and then folks and also let folks know the number to text as well if they can't access the poll. Okay. So let's uh, move on to our next presentation, uh, Emerald Ash Borer Preparation, Response, and Management. And Jan Santer is going to uh, lead this one. So Jan, are you ready? I am, yeah. So let me share my screen. And I love how it, yeah, my screen goes all wonky there. OK. Um, Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, yes. That, that works great. Um, trying to get it so I can see you guys again. Okay, there we go. All right, <laughs> um, so uh, I've, I'm familiar with most of you here on the call today, I think, but um, for the purposes of introduction, again, my name is Jan Santer. I am the Urban and Community Forestry Program Coordinator, otherwise known as Project Canopy with the Maine Forest Service. And for those of you that are not familiar with Project Canopy, this is the state's Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, what we do is assist cities and towns, schools and nonprofit organizations with education, technical assistance and grants to help guide management of urban and community trees and forest resources throughout the state of Maine. And I'm not gonna advance my slide. Okay. So um, in, in targeting this, this program, this presentation today to um, particularly to municipalities, but any organizations that, that manage public tree resources, are you ready? Are you ready for the EAB infestation? that is here and <clears throat> or that is coming. Um, we encourage all main communities to determine their indiv individual management strategy for ash street trees and shade trees, as well as for ash and public forests in response to the growing emerald ash borer infestation. 
As with any perturbation, there is the ability to choose to do nothing. But it is important to recognize that even when a community chooses to do nothing proactive, it will still fall on the responsibility of the community to manage those public trees for public safety when they do eventually succumb to EAB, which most will. Communities can also choose to remove all trees that potentially could be host to EAB. Um, and ideally to replant with trees that are not host species. While this approach eliminates risk from EAB in induced ash mortality, the cost is initially very high and it will significantly alter the community landscape with the respect of, of your public shade trees for the next decade or more. So ideally, we encourage communities to take more middle of the road approach, um, to remove ash already in decline and to retain healthy ash trees, potentially for treatment, um, as well as um, just, just monitor for uh, EAB infestation. And with this selective approach, active monitoring efforts are critical to guide your ongoing response. So with, with that selective approach, um, you know, understanding what you have for resources uh, is the initial um, response that a community needs to take. You know, need to know what you have for ash trees, but you also need, need to consider what you have for capacity. What volunteer groups, what staff do you have um, on board? What, uh, you know, your local arborists are available to um, assist with these efforts, pesticide applicators and more. And then from there to um, start developing that management response. Just to frame up um, what we have for ash here in Maine, um, this is a couple of, of graphics pulled from our continuous forest inventory. Um, in Maine's woods, we know ash is not as abundant as some species such as oak or maple, though locally it can be very abundant. On a statewide basis in our forests, ash comprise roughly 2% of all trees, um, all trees in Maine being 23 billion trees. So 2% of those 23 billion trees are ash. And similarly, roughly 2% of our merchantable volume is also ash. Again, this is in the forest. Uh, while that may seem like a small amount, it still equates to hundreds of millions of ash trees, mostly in those smaller size classes. Street and park tree composition can be much higher as an overall position. Some communities that have inventories in Maine know they have an ash tree composition upwards of, of 10 and 15 percent of their overall street trees. Um, and this is as a result of um, tree replacement that took place in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, largely as a result of replacing our elms lost to Dutch elm disease. So, you know, this is quick. We're going to go into a case study um, for communities that are interested in planning. The Maine Forest Service and the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry has numerous uh, uh, resources available on that website that Allison put up there at the beginning, um, including some sample plans and guidance documents for foresters, for um, for homeowners, for communities to, to be able to um, hand out to uh, residents and, and more. And then we also have links to the, the great body of work that is out there from other states and um, other parts of the country where they have been living with this EAB infestation for much longer than we have and um, and have uh, you know been able to learn from that and, and uh, develop much um, much more work um, in response to uh, you know guiding you to how to deal with it so that's me, that's my contact information. I encourage any of you to reach out to me or any of us um, at the DACF to uh, find out what you can do next. 
Oh, and I should have said we have grants too. So <laughs> that was the, the, the most important thing on that resources slide is we have some money to help support planning efforts as well as replacement efforts of the bash. So I will stop sharing now. All right, thanks, Jan. Great job. So now I guess we're transitioning over to a case study. And we've got uh, two guest speakers, Glenn Docterman and Eric Grove, and they're going to talk about the uh, Alfred Main situation. So, Glenn, are you there? So far, we can't hear you. Okay, I'm on now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm a selectman in the town of Alfred, but I uh, kind of like to think of myself first as a, uh, a seasonal employee managing uh, some of the parks in southern Maine. I manage Fort McCleary, John Paul Jones, and uh, uh, Vaughn Wood State Park. Um, so I'm I'm pretty familiar with the the problems, of course, that we've have. Uh, with some of our trees and plants and invasives and, and so forth. Uh, and I work a lot at uh, times with uh, Allison and uh, Colleen and, and Wayne. They have come down. Um, in fact, they have the um, parasitic wasp uh, delivered to my my location here where I live in Alford. And uh, then they pick them up and they distribute them where they need. Um, the main thing that I'm concerned, of course, is with right now is Brothers Beach, which is... Uh, property that we purchased maybe oh, six, seven years ago in the town of Alfred. It's a little over 33 acres. We already have another parcel of land, about 39, which is where our transfer station is on. But the Brothers Beach is really a beautiful piece of property that was uh, next to the, uh, owned by the, um, the Shakers up on uh, Shaker Hill. Um, the monastery had that property for hundreds of years. Um, in 1950, that 33.6 acres was actually a uh, um, you know, field area where they had cattle and so forth in there. So we, we see signs of barbed wire and all. It had been actually logged years ago. And then again, uh, more recently, some logging was done, kind of a selective logging uh, by private um, loggers for that uh, the property. Once we purchased it, it was desired to continue to be a little beach area and, and a park. We're, we're not really trying to go in there to manage it for uh, making money or uh, just making a, a uh, selective cutting. We really want to improve the property, add some educational value, nature trails and hiking trails throughout that area. Uh, it's right along the Shaker Pond, which is a beautiful little piece of water there in the town of Alfred. Um, but we have a lot of ash on there. so. Uh, applying for the grant with Jan really helped us um, getting the money to actually hire a, a manager, a forest manager. Uh, the forest, uh, Eric Grove, I don't know if Eric's here today, I hope so, um, because he's been really working hard to help put together our management plan, which we have, and it's been approved, and the town is very happy with it. Of course, there's always some concern on what's going to happen. Um, when we take the ash out and, and we do have a lot of invasive species that come in there um, a lot of shrubs and plants and vines that we really don't don't want so there's been a big question of how we will control that control that even looking at hiring people with goats to come in but we're probably going to do uh, a spraying after we knock everything down so eric really has the the great plan on all of that he's put it together uh, we don't want to take all the ash out uh, we don't want to Thin it so much that we will get grief from uh, residents say, what have you done to it? We want to make it in, in sections. So we'll probably take out, um, we, we have a forester, I mean a uh, logger that will come in and take a certain amount of ash. We'll, we'll even get some actually veneer out of uh, some of the larger ash. Uh, we'll leave some little ash because right across the street on the Shaker property, is uh, where they've been releasing a lot of the wasp and there's a lot of ash trees there. So we're hoping that uh, some of the wasps will come down and, and and they probably have been, Allison might know, or uh, Colleen that they've been probably working on our trees there. So we'll leave some young ash 
to p- provide, you know, an area for some of the beetles to come in and then food for the young ash. Uh, so we'll probably take a section out um, on both ends and leave a strip in the middle uh, because we are on a, a, a slope which is comes into the uh, next to the pond and we don't want to cause any type of an erosion. So we'll take out what we can, use that money to make improvements, take care of invasive plants and, and improve the property. Uh, what we leave, we probably come back in four or five years. If it's still there uh, and alive, then we'll we'll harvest that. If not, then it's going to become um, firewood. Uh, and that's pretty much what Eric kind of suggested we do. This way it's not looking like a, a real heavy cut. So we'll leave some there and uh, come back. And like I say, if it doesn't work out well, then uh, we'll end up with just some firewood in that area. But that's pretty much it, um, and we we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a logger for that company will come in, uh, and once the ground freezes enough, um, we might be able to get in there in January. So we've done very well. We applied for the grant back in March of um, 2020, and um, we we got the grant approved. We used that money, right, uh, to hire the forester. All of that's been paid for and approved. Uh, so we're ready to go. Um, a big question is, um, you know, they, they, there's not much money for pulp, uh, for, not pulp, but uh, chips. So what's going to happen with the chips? We kind of still have a little problem there. We don't want, I like using chips on the trails. People quite often don't because it's going to decompose and uh, it just doesn't hold up well. Um, but we have nothing else to really use on there. We don't want, uh, we, we have a problem of the, distributing it because we have a small committee uh, and it doesn't mean that they're going to get out and do it. So we'll probably end up hauling a lot of the chips out of there and then work with uh, what we can left over for trails. So I don't know if Eric's there. I think yeah, it'd be well, good. I know he's on, but I don't know if he got on so he oh, can talk. Eric. Eric. Oh, it's too bad because he's got us some good prices. Uh, and like I say, we're not out to make any money on it, but, uh, the idea is, um, of course, they'll take some other trees, anything that's really very, um, oh, you know, interesting trees that we, we, even if it's a nice red maple, we'll probably leave that. And of course, any nice oaks that we have, we have to give some added away, uh, but we're really after to get the ash out because we know Colleen or Wayne could tell you, you know, it's, it's pretty saturated in that area. I mean, we're, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away from where they're actually releasing all of the, uh, a lot of the wasps. So we're loaded there. And up at the Brothers, they have a lot of ash, more of a, a smaller diameter, which would be good for like uh, baseball bats and so forth. And I think they want to also go up there and, and uh, harvest some of that. So. So Eric is on the phone, and I think he's ready to, to chime oh, in. Eric, you there? I think. Yeah. Good. I am here. I apologize for not having to call in and not have a speaker. Uh, from a forester's perspective, I, I feel like I started this project off when the EAB was first detected over on the, the border towns here a couple years ago. I brought the this subject up to the so one of the other selectmen that I've done a fair amount of business with, and then it was brought up to the beach committee. Um, I find, like most natural resource things, the answers and the planning is fairly easy, but the most complicated part of the project is always getting... Uh, the landowner, or more importantly, a group of landowners or management by committee, um, achieving some consensus and deciding what to do. Uh, the majority of the people on the beach committee didn't want to see any trees harvested on this site. Uh, additionally, they were convinced that there were no trees of any value or any size. So I encouraged the town to take advantage of the Project Canopy Grant, which was a great tool to get some data and some mapping so that everybody had good hard information on decision making. Uh, and in truth, um, there's probably about 50,000 feet of 
logs and veneer on this 15 acres. So the town does actually have some resources there to help with um, expenses in managing the site. Uh, as a recreational property, the probably the biggest concern is the the danger of, of the dying trees breaking up and falling and striking people in the recreation area. Um, but, uh, my biggest challenge is about a half the site is not stocked with ash and not being able to convince anybody in the town that we should proactively manage the other area of the forest to maintain good forest health. So um, it's been like pulling teeth to get the dangerous trees cut. I can't. So, um, and as far as the detail of the plan, uh, once we finally got the consensus that the trees did need to be harvested and that there was significant value, uh, we're planning a winter harvest so we can optimally man uh, market the wood. And part of the reason we decided to not cut 100% of the ash was due to the site being stocked with the parasitic wasps. Um, I've touched base with Allison a couple times uh, and the, the other Forest Service employees about how to best coordinate a harvest without eliminating those insects that you've just recently um, planted on the site. Uh, so hopefully the smaller age uh, diameter class of ash will act as a reservoir to hold some of the, the emerald ash borer as well as the parasitic wasps and not completely wipe out the population. Um, and also this site, most of it falls within the shoreland zone, so that adds complication in terms of a commercial timber harvest. And by leaving those trees there, it's hoped that it will buffer the site a little bit for the shoreland zone as well as buffering the residents that live across the lake so that they are not um, subject to all the traffic on the state road. Um, and I think the town would be happy to host a site, site visit or a walk or a look uh, if there's any interest in that down the road. But I know as forestry professionals would kind of feel like we're a little bit bored with EAB because we've been talking about it for 10 years now. <laughs> well, anytime they want to come down, we'll, we'll give them a tour. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I don't know if people have questions for Glenn or Eric. I don't see any in the chat. I'll just reiterate that management by committee is probably the toughest thing you'll do. Yeah. Yeah. I have to thank Eric how many times he came in above and beyond to meet with our uh, Brothers Beach Committee because of their concerns and, and work things out. So he spent a lot of time, did a wonderful job. Thank you. And in the chat, uh, Tyler Everett, who's a, a tribal representative and a University of Maine graduate student, is interested in checking out the property. So we can Great. probably get you connected. Yeah, give me a call and we get together with Eric and or myself and we'll get out there. Yeah, we can pass along information to help you yeah, make that yeah, connection. Yeah, email and so forth, yeah. Yeah, uh, and Tyler did put his email in the chat, if you can get to that, Glenn. Okay. All right, let's uh, move on to the next case study, uh, CMP distribution line maintenance and uh, Katie Hall, are you are you here? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We Perfect. can, Katie. I'm going to put up your slide. Okay, thanks, Jen. So thanks for having me on your call today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I my name is Katie. I'm the area forester uh, for the Alfred Service Center for Central Maine Power, which is down um, 
in the heart of York County and and well timed or well located with the previous case study um, in Alfred. So a few years ago, I had the pleasure of working with both Colleen and Wayne at the Maine Forest Service to collect samples from ash within um, the district to determine if EAB was present. And I think at this point, everybody um, who's been following EAB is kind of aware of how that turned out. Um, so over the past couple of years, it's definitely been increasingly evident that emerald ash borer is firmly located, uh, firmly established rather in York County. And it's a problem um, that will certainly persist in our service area uh, territory as it continues to spread. Um, however, it's not a pest that as a utility we're planning at this point to aggressively target any differently than we would any other dead or dying tree around our infrastructure. Um, you know, as everyone's well aware, there's a number of, of pests and diseases out there that impact our trees in the state of Maine. Um, and that coupled with natural tree mortality, storm events, um, and really any other thing all those contribute to trees failing um, and landing on the line and impacting the grid. So a very large part of my job as a forest surface CMP is needing to balance what um, we do as a utility as far as pruning to a set specification and balancing that with the customer's desire to maintain their yard tree. And on top of that, also keeping in mind safety and power reliability. So by solely targeting ash and potentially ignoring other hazards, I would compromise all of those goals that I have to balance. So what am I doing? Um, as you can see on the slide, CMP does have a cycle trim program. Um, and what we do is we implement routine vegetation maintenance to a set specification on a five year rotating basis to make sure we cover all of our line miles on a regular interval. Um, roughly that specification is to prune and remove trees within eight feet to either side of the conductor, 15 feet of overhead branches, whether they're alive or not, um, deadwood at any height over the primary conductor, and then a ground cut of any tree capable of growing into the wire zone, which roughly we would consider the, the neutral of the communication lines. And then with that, healthy trees um, within that eight feet can remain at the forester's discretion. However, in a perfect universe, we try to um, remove as many trees in that eight foot zone, especially on your hardwoods that are, are more apt to regrow into the primary line after a pruning. Um, but it's pretty common. You'll see like a, you know, a healthy large pine tree um, or a tree like that within that eight foot. So after we do the, you know, the basic between um, the eight feet, we also go out to 14 feet, removing any dead tree or a tree with a significant defect that wouldn't last until our next cycle. So you might might be curious at that point in speaking with uh, EAB, what happens if an healthy, healthy ash tree is not removed on the cycle and it succumbs to EAB a year or two later? In cases like that, which with the way EAB is kind of moving, spreading through the state is pretty likely, um, the dead ash would be captured the way I take care of any other tree that might die in that five year cycle. Um, Part of what I do is called a hazard survey. So any circuit that is not up for its five year maintenance, I'll do a write out, um, look for anything that's dead or dying, write up a list and provide that to our vendor to go out and remove those trees on an off cycle basis. Um, another way I can capture those trees is if a customer calls in to Central Maine Power and requests for um, myself in, in your county or any of the other foresters and the other service centers, uh, they would file a notification. Basically, what that does on our end is triggers a visit to the property to evaluate their tree concern. And if it's something that warrants an immediate removal, we'll do that as soon as possible um, after that call from the customer. Or if we go out there and the tree is it, dying, but it's close enough to that next cycle point where we can capture it, then we'll do it at that time. Um, going forward, one of the questions Jan wanted me to consider is what do I see as the largest problem with the Emerald Ash Borer as it relates to the utility itself and in a perfect world, how would I treat it? I think the largest problem that I fear is that, you know, there'll be basically a mass devastation of ash at a single point in time, um, recognizing that there are some local pockets where you do have a high abundance of ash compared to um, your maples, your oaks, your other species. 
that are on the streets and along the distribution lines more than my budget can sustain on any given year trying to target those trees. So with that fear is that um, while communities are starting to understand what emerald ash borer is and how devastating it can be, um, that once trees outside of our maintenance right of way start to fall on the lines and cause outages, that the customer base won't put two and two together. So understandably as a customer, you start having more power outages um, than you have in years prior is definitely upsetting um, and it could just be a local impact based on the prevalence of ash and how quickly it's dying off. So as a forester, I can only manage what I have the budget and the resources to remove in any given year within that designated work area that we have. So I think a way to tackle it would be is if I had an unlimited budget or a you know, pretty healthy grant to work with and a dedicated workforce that's their sole focus would be to target ash trees. The goal would be to remove as many of those dead trees as possible and in areas with a, a higher number of emerald ash borer detections or, um, you know, the, just the possibility where you have more mortality, maybe starting to tackle some of those healthy trees as well. But with that, I think an important piece to consider would be um, having an education and a permissioning team going along with the workers who would be taking those ash trees down just to help educate customers on um, why we would be taking a more proactive and really a more aggressive approach than anything that the utility is doing right now to manage emerald ash borer. Um, so basically that's all I have um, for you guys today. Thanks for taking a minute to listen to my thoughts on emerald ash borer. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take any. Thank you so much, Katie. Any uh, quick questions for Katie? All right, now I see some polls coming up. <laughs> yeah, so the poll question for those on the phone, does your town have an emerald ash borer response plan? Yes, no, I don't know. And if you don't know, maybe find out. Yeah, and Responses are coming in and they're mostly no's and a few I don't know's, a one yes so far. And I think at this point we uh, wanted to uh, turn it over to you out there, especially those that are within a municipality and find out if your municipality is doing anything to respond to Emerald Ashmore. So anybody want to to speak up. I see a couple of questions in the chat. At some point, can we have the rationale for removing non-affected ash trees? Anybody want to take that one on? I can take that one if you don't want to do that, Gary. So. Um... As far as removing non-affected ash trees, um, if you have ash that are threatening infrastructure, um, then and you don't plan on keeping them alive with insecticide treatments, then removing them um, in advance of emerald ash borer does make sense, um, particularly if you're close to where emerald ash borer has been detected or if the trees are already declining from other things. Um, that's because it's more expensive to remove them after they die, and uh, they become a threat pretty rapidly after they are attacked by emerald ash borer. The wood strength really degrades very quickly. Thanks, Allison. I, I would add to that also, um, you know, from a municipal perspective, your your budget is a primary concern. And if you do some proactive management of trees that um, as Allison said, you're likely to not keep once EAB is uh, a problem. Um, you're effectively spreading out your budget so that you're better able to adapt when you have that larger flood of trees that you need to remove um, in, in more of a hurry when it comes to public safety. Thanks, Jan. There's another question here. Can anyone comment on U.S. Forest Service research in the upper Midwest, which has no cutting and seeing which ash survives 
called something like stragglers and then grow seeds from these survivors. Want to take that one too, Allison? I know, is, is uh, Nate on? He was planning on, on joining. Um, uh, I don't know you, if, yeah. if Nate Seeger is on. Um, but if he isn't, <laughs> um, a lot of times folks talk about lingering ash. Um, and those are ash trees that have survived a wave of emerald ash borer, whether there's a history of harvest or not, ash that were left behind that survived a wave of emerald ash borer. And um, they uh, are looking for those lingering ash to see, you know, it'd be, it'd be helpful to know where they are in the population so that they can collect seeds and, and to help to promote the, um, it's generally white ash um, in the environment. Uh, in general, they're not seeing a lot of uh, tolerance by the brown or green ash. Um, so it, it, I can't really speak to it too much. I know that they did go through and they measured, I think it was about 30 plots and they had a range of survival of ash on those plots from anywhere from 0% to 100%. So a real range in um, the the data collected there. Um, so it's it's good news in, in that there are more ash surviving in some places than anybody would have ever anticipated. And so that does allow for um, the species to be kept on the landscape. I don't know if Colleen or anybody else has anything else to add to that one. All right, thanks, Allison. And I didn't find Nate in the list, so I, I don't think he's here. Well, we've got uh, a few more minutes for a couple uh, can, more questions. Hello? Yes. Um, so um, I was the person who put in that question. This is Lindsay Nelson uh, about the lingering. Thank you for the term, Ash. And um, is there funding for this, or, or how is that proceeding, or? Is it, was it a one-off, this research on the lingering ash and, and trying to grow from seed? But thank you for your comments, Allison. Yeah, I believe it was funded. There is an organization out there, and I can't remember what it stands for. I think it's MAMA, is that right, <laughs> Tom or Colleen? Yeah, it's, it stands for uh, Monitoring and Managing Ash. And so that does provide a platform where people can um, actually report uh, that they have found lingering ash. We're a little bit early in invasion here in Maine to expect to be able to identify lingering ash, but it's definitely something that we're keeping taps on as far as uh, you know when when it's appropriate to start to ask for folks to report in what they're seeing here. And I see that folks are still having trouble with the poll, so um, I think. Uh, I guess it's it's probably permissions related stuff. Um, so you can, I saw that, uh, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said they were gonna kind of track the answers and then submit them at the end and that would be perfect. Um, so if you uh, can actually like write down your answer, send it in an email at the end to foresthealth.maine.gov. Of course, if you're on the phone, you can also text your answers into that 949-5712. Uh, and the current poll question is, does your town have an emerald ash borer response plan? Allison, right. I'd like to add to uh, some of that comments about lingering ash. Um, well, we've got about one minute before we need to transition. OK, um, I was just going to add that uh, a lot of uh, tribal nations are interested in the seed collection effort. And it's a program that's in the early start, so we don't have a, a concrete effort underway at the moment. Um, but in an idea that you might be able to harvest some ash seed and put it in a seed banking facility and then use it to repatriate the species uh, when emerald ash borer populations are at a more managed level, um, that's kind of the sense behind that program. And also exploring the ways in which we could propagate that seed and maybe underplant in some of these um, these sites that we're we're exploring different management. So, uh, as that program develops, if there's a, a 
a chance to connect with folks, I'll certainly reach out to Allison in the group here. All right, thank you very much, Tyler. And we can maybe at the very end come back to some of these questions, but we want to give time for uh, Tom to get started on uh, brown tail moth. So let's uh, switch gears here a little bit. And Tom Schmelk, uh, who is the lead uh, forest entomologist on uh, brown tail moth, uh, will give us a little update on that and management options. Um, Jan, I think you're still sharing your screen. I'm so sorry, I just talked. <laughs> Uh, can you see that? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so like Gary said, uh, my name is Tom Schmelk. I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service, um, and I'm the program lead on brown tail. Um, so as you may well know, uh, brown tail moth has continued to expand its range um, further inland and, and further north in Maine uh, this year. And the most heavily impacted counties uh, are Androscoggin, and Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo. Um, also, some of the most populated counties. Uh, so we did receive uh, a very, very high call volume this year, uh, well over 500 calls um, by just the Maine Forest Service, um, in addition to some of our other state cooperators like CDC um, and Extension and 211. Uh, so, if you some of some of you do know this, but we do two rounds of aerial survey each year. Um, one survey is in the late spring, early summer to pick up the actual defoliation from the uh, mature caterpillars, and then we fly another round of aerial survey in the late summer, early fall to pick up the skeletonization damage from the young caterpillars. So these are just some uh, basically uh, acres defoliated. Per county, as you can see, the grand total at the bottom here is uh, right around 200,000 acres. So this is uh, quite the increase, even from uh, last year, where we had around 156,000 acres of defoliation, and it sort of um, speaks to the volume of uh, brown tail's presence in Maine um, in the in the current year. Uh, this is a uh, a photo from a couple of years ago, but um, it's still sort of what we're seeing. Uh, this area in the middle of the screen here with this uh, sort of light brown color, that's those are stands of oak trees that have been defoliated. And, and this is uh, out, out sort of by the Camden Hills area. Um, and this damage sort of extended, you know, pretty far up. Uh, same was true for this year, um, although there were, were certainly new towns and, and new areas that were uh, experiencing heavy defoliation. Uh, so in addition to uh, those two aerial surveys for defoliation that I talked about, uh, there is an, uh, an annual winter web survey. That survey typically begins uh, towards the end of December or early January. And in that survey, uh, our technicians basically drive the roads, the, all the major roads throughout the infested area, as well as some buffer to capture any range expansion or satellite populations. Um, and basically we drop data points uh, for given stretches of road, estimating the number of webs per tree. So um, each of these colored data points here, obviously the hotter the color, the more webs per tree that we were finding. Um, so each of these data points uh, is associated with GPS coordinates, uh, host tree type, and uh, the number of, of webs, as well as the uh, um, the the pattern of webs. So continuous, patchy, or or single. If it's in a uh, single tree in somebody's yard. Uh, so one thing of note here. Um, so this area circled uh, up in Arusta County. Um, that was uh, so. This past winter, uh, our Technicians picked up two satellite, or three, actually three satellite populations. I forgot to put the third one in here, um, but three satellite populations uh, up in the county. 
of, of just a single web uh, each. And that sort of speaks to the to the volume of how well brown tail can uh, spread and, and um, hitchhike rides. So this area that's circled here in red, that's where the main bulk of the population of brown tail is. So you can see, uh, you know, quite it's it spread quite the distance. Again, these are just single single web detections, but um, you know, it's brown tail is, is very very good at hitchhiking. Do not underestimate it. Uh, so some good news and some bad news on the brown tail pathogen front. Um, so, as you know, this is sort of the third year of drought that we've had uh, in Maine, and that definitely affects uh, the, the pathogens surrounding brown tail. Uh, so when it's, it's hot and dry, it's not very good for the spread and proliferation of the fungus and the virus that attack brown tail. Um, but even though it, it was hot and dry, we did detect some isolated pockets of these pathogens. Um, so this photo shows uh, an apple tree in Belfast, a single apple tree uh, that was completely denuded, but also uh, experienced a 100% mortality um, due to the fungus, and, and there was some virus present at the site as well, um, which is good news because uh, even though it's it didn't get to spread, um, you know, far and wide, it it is present, and we another. Um, sort of silver lining to this that we uh, discovered this year is that the both the fungus and the virus are very widespread in Maine. Um, pretty much, pretty much everywhere you find brown tail in Maine, there are very small isolated pockets of these pathogens. Um, it, I was very surprised, so I went on a site visit up in Blue Hill, and I was very surprised to see the fungus um, and the virus already there. Um, so very widespread, Blue Hill, uh, down where I live in Dresden, we saw some of the virus. Um, but unfortunately, in order for to have a huge population collapse and to have these pathogens spread and sort of rip through the population, uh, we will need a, a basically a normal spring, a, a wet um, a wet May and June in particular, um, will help help these pathogens bring down brown tail. Um, unfortunately, at, at the scale it is right now, it, it might possibly take a couple of years of this wet, you know, normal spring weather to to really crash the population. So fingers and toes crossed for this spring. Um, this was over at my house, and as you can see, with uh, a lot of these pathogens, um, they were kind of delayed. So a lot of the caterpillars were already starting to pupate. Um, by the time most of them experienced mortality. So um, most of the damage to the trees was done. Um, this caterpillar that's hanging here um, is most likely uh, killed by the virus. Uh, so we also saw some uh, very late season uh, pathogen activity. So in September, um, as I was doing some of the checkups for uh, these weekly to uh, weekly monitoring updates that we were posting on the website every week. Um, I did find some some mortality of the very young caterpillars as they were building their their winter web or as it was nearly complete. Um, they sort of just melted um, melted into the web here. Um, so it's good news. It was a little bit widespread at least here on campus in Augusta. Um, there were multiple trees with um, these deceased caterpillars hanging out. Um, and also, uh, we can't forget about the parasitoids. Um, so, also in in monitoring, uh, doing those developmental uh, monitoring updates, uh, I did uh, see some ticketed flies um, sort of poking around these winter webs. And for those of you who don't know, so ticketidae are a group of exclusively uh, parasitoid flies, very very large family, um, and they all. Um, they all rely on other insects or arthropods to complete their life cycle, um, and and many do use brown tail. Um, Carla Boyd up at UMaine um, did a lot of her um, thesis work on the parasitoids of brown tail in Maine. So some good news. Um, so we do have some new and sharpened tools 
uh, to to basically disseminate in, information to the public. Um, we recently completely revised the frequently asked questions page. Uh, basically uh, reformatted some of it, but most importantly, we added many questions um, involving inject uh, tree injections, uh, um, but then also animal health. Uh, so oh, uh, probably a little over half of the people that were calling this spring and summer were um, were asking about the tree injections. So we decided to um, to collaborate with uh, BP uh, Board Pesticide Control and CDC um, and the state vet to to get some of these questions added and updated. Uh, we also uh, created a brown tail moth dashboard. Um, this is an interactive. Uh, so it, it's a basically an interactive map um, that uses the the data from our aerial surveys and also the data from the winter web surveys. Um, and you can zoom in and and look at what's going on in your town. Uh, we decided to move away from the traditional uh, brown tail moth risk map that we had um, for the past, you know, previous previous years in order to um, sort of focus in on on just the raw data and what's going on um, in, in the, each of those towns. Uh, there's a link to it here, but it's also available right on our brown tail moth uh, main forest service page. Um, it's under survey and, and management. Um, also, probably most importantly for this call, um, we are so revisions to the main municipal battle book for brown tail moth are nearing completion. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is a uh, basically a toolbox for municipalities um, to guide them in their uh, fight against brown tail moth. Um, some of the things that it includes are some of the uh, regulations. Um, there is a sort of a work plan, a schedule um, throughout the year about, you know, what should be done, what time of the year, and it sort of um, walks you through that whole process. Um, everything from scouting out where the winter webs are uh, to lining up treatment or, um, you know, sort of guiding in that decision. Uh, and that will be available soon. In fact, right after this call, um, I'm going to com continue working on that uh, so that it's available. OK, so now we're going to get into the management uh, side of things. So probably the most important thing is the first step to management is always education, um, educating the public. So even though we at the Maine Forest Service has, have done no shortage of outreach and um, uh, <laughs> interviews and uh, you know newspaper articles and press releases, Unfortunately, uh, we are not able to reach everybody and a very good percentage, I would say about uh, 30 or 40 percent of the people that were calling me this uh, past spring and summer would start off by the conversation by saying, you know, my apple tree in my front yard or my crab apple tree in my front yard. Um, and for the most part, these those trees, those fruit trees or ornamentals are the easiest to flip webs out. Um, and they could have saved themselves uh, a whole lot of trouble and headache and rashes um, if they had been able to clip out those webs. Um, so we're setting up brown, uh, we're setting up February to be uh, Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month um, in hopes of increasing uh, public participation and uh, just getting the word out about brown tail. A lot of these communities that are experiencing brown tail for the first time, um, they typically think of brown tail as uh, just a coastal issue, and they're taken by surprise when it shows up in their yard, even though uh, we have been warning for, for many years now. Um, so some of the different ways to get the community involved. Um, is, so community education, uh, I have given countless talks to, to town and municipalities, these informational sessions um, to sort of get the word out. Uh, service projects. So um, townwide surveys or townwide web clippings um, or townwide celebrations that involve, uh, you know, community web clipping and a, a bonfire at the end um, and neighborhood contests. Everybody loves a good competition, um, you know, pitting neighborhoods or even towns against each other to see who can, um, you know, clip the most webs. 
so the reason why February, uh, we picked February to be Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month, um, because February and the winter in general is a, a very, very good time for um, looking for those webs because you can see them. Most of the leaves are off the trees. Uh, and if you're surveying on a nice, bright, sunny day with the sun to your back, those webs really um, pop out and they, they shine and you can, um, you can pick them out over uh, leaves that are, are still hanging on the trees. Um, it also gives time to individuals, um, and homeowners and towns to, um, to figure out where the, the webs are, where the most webs are, and to plan and inform their management decisions. Um, and this web clipping or these web clipping events are ideally completed by uh, early April. Um, so some of the other uh, some of the other actions that towns can take um, is for towns or, or city websites that have a, a brown tail moth presence. Um, many towns basically link to our uh, our own main forest service website and our online resources there, um, which is always good. Um, social media reminders at, at key times during the year will help get the word out and inform uh, your citizens and your constituents to um, get out there and be proactive. Um, signage warning of infestations. Uh, I have it a little bit later in my presentation, um, but the city of Portland has done a, a really excellent job with um, with disseminating to the public, you know, the risks of brown tail uh, with these um, with these signs. Um, and then there's also referral to 211 for more information. Um, 211 has been trained uh, on our frequently asked questions, um, and they are a very, very good resource. We appreciate them a lot. Oh, I should mention. So this was a web clipping event, uh, annual web clipping event um, that happens on Deer Isle. It's actually multiple events throughout the the winter, um, they usually go up for one or two of those events. And um, Deer, uh, the town of Deer Isle and Little, Little Deer Isle uh, have done a really excellent job with community engagement, uh, especially the the land trusts up there, um, getting the word out and and um, you know making it into a fun activity, um, cutting cutting these areas into pieces, you know to to go through and um, get almost all the webs. Um, and, and really help out up there. Um, so this is what the, the webs will look like on a nice, bright, sunny day. You know, know where your enemy is, know where the hot spots in your town are, or even in your own dooryard, and that will help inform your management decisions um, during the winter or the, the following spring. Okay, so there's three uh, three categories of management, um, and each town or municipality uh, will have a mix of these. It's not, uh, you know, one uh, one size fits all. Uh, so the first category of management is to do nothing, um, and of course that saves money. Um, but if, depending on uh, the situation in each town, uh, there may be significant quality of life impacts um, as well as other potential impacts. Um, some being economic. Um, so one of the other things is uh, if you do choose to do nothing, you might need to provide information uh, about the presence of brown tail in really highly infested areas. Uh, and this is what I was talking about um, before uh, with the city of Portland um, having these posters um, posted in Deering Oaks Park and, and other potential risk sites. Um, and then you also might need to consider shutting some areas off um, during peak caterpillar activity. Um, I know this happens at Wolf's Neck State Park and some of the other state parks um, in that area is they have to close off um, close off sections of the park um, to prevent people from coming into contact with these hares. Um, the other one of the other uh, categories of treatment is mechanical um, and. Like we were saying, web clipping is best done when the trees are dormant um, because you can see all the, it's less harm to the tree and you can see where all the webs are very clearly. Risk of uh, hair activity is very low. Um, and this clipping should be, like I mentioned before, this clipping should be done before mid-April and you're gonna wanna destroy the webs once you clip them out. If these clipped webs just land on the ground, um, the caterpillars are very good at finding food and will climb uh, right back up on the tree in the spring. 
Uh, so this mechanical clipping is not practical for all trees, especially in, in most areas of, uh, especially coastal Maine have large mature oak trees that are very high, um, but arborists can sometimes treat uh, and clip out these webs from trees that are out of the reach of um, homeowners and municipalities. Um, so in the city of Bath, um, when Kyle Rosenberg was the uh, city arborist, um, they did have a bucket truck and would go around and, and clip um, a lot of these webs along the streets. And that um, was really, really a great help. Um, inside each of these palm sized webs is between 25 and 400 caterpillars. So um, every single one that you can get, um, whether by hand or a bucket truck, uh, will help. Uh, so one of the other categories is insecticides. Um, there's a few, obviously, a few different application methods. Uh, so you have aerial application, uh, which is the best option for uh, very wide control, um, but it's difficult to get buy-in from the public. Um, a lot of people are hesitant to, to be spraying stuff from an airplane. Uh, even if you were just spraying water, um, people, a lot of people would not be um, okay with that. Um, so, so getting that buy-in from the public is, is sometimes difficult. Um, it's not practical for individual ownerships, uh, just because of the, the nature of the beast. You're spraying from an airplane, very, uh, very difficult to hit, you know, these small targets, uh, of individual houses or, uh, very small individual woodlots. Um, also individuals can opt out of, uh, opt out of the spray program, uh, which means you get this sort of Swiss cheese hole pattern. Um, and when the when the spray pattern is um, patchy, uh, it's it's pretty, pretty ineffective. So when people opt out, you have to leave their property and then you also have to leave a buffer um, on the edge of their property, uh, which cont contributes to that Swiss cheese pattern. Um, okay, and then for the because of the potential use of more targeted pro uh, products like BTK, um, or if we we're ever able to get the fungus or the virus um, weaponized, um, you and with these aerial surveys when, or aerial sprays, when you eliminate you know individuals treating their own properties, um, it, it's often better ecologically. Um, a lot of the ground rates. Um, have a, a higher rate of application, so you're using more product um, compared to aerial. Um, but there, there are many other hurdles to uh, to these aerial applications. Uh, so then you have foliar ground applications, um, and Jeff Tarling uh, will talk about this uh, in a little bit. Um, but they treated Deering Oaks Park, um, and they had Whitney Tree come in with this uh, mist blower. Um, some of the drawbacks to foliar ground applications is you do need an adequate leaf surface to spray on, um, which is sometimes not until, you know, the third week of May or towards the end of May, depending on the, the year and the weather. Um, but you need that leaf surface in order to be able to spray on. Um, it can also be difficult to get public buy-in. Um, I know when the, the spraying of Deering Oaks was proposed, there was a lot of, um, uh, Maybe not a lot, but there was definitely some public outcry. Um, but eventually, um, they were able to get it done. Um, so, just in general, with woodlots and and trees that are sort of away from people's houses, um, it, they can be limited in in uh, woodlots or, or forest stands. Um, but so one of the the biggest things that I got this year. A lot of people would call me after they called the tree company and um, because their oak had no leaves on it and they thought it was automatically dead and they had the tree company come and cut them down. Um, and I wish they had spoken to me first because those trees um, were going to leaf out if they hadn't succumbed um, to brown tail, they would leaf out again um, in, in July after the feeding had been done. Um, oaks and Trees in general, but oaks in particular, are very tolerant of defoliation and can survive multiple years of being completely defoliated. Um, although this is compounded by um, different uh, 
different mm -hmm. things in Maine. So there are other insects, other invasive insects that feed on oak, uh, like Limancheri dispar, formerly known as gypsy moth, um, and winter moth. When you get um, multiple species defoliating a tree um, in a given season, it can really take a toll. Um, and also the drought that we've been experiencing in Maine for the past few years um, has really stressed the trees out a little bit more than normal. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, uh, about half or over half of the people that called this year were asking about tree injections. Um, there are some benefits and there are some drawbacks. Um, it is more targeted than uh, broadcast spraying, uh, but it can be very, the the um, materials are expensive and the cost can be prohibitive at a larger scale, um, but it is very useful for um, sensitive areas near water um, or specimen trees or trees that are in heavily used areas. Like if you have trees overhanging your house or your deck or a driveway, um, it, it can be um, it can be beneficial that way. Um, we there has been, <laughs> there can be some user error um, if. People do not follow the directions um, at, on the label, um, but but generally um, people put it together and, and it's able to work for them. Um, I should also note with a lot of these chemical options, most of these chemical treatments are focused on mitigating people coming into contact with the hairs or reducing the populations um, of brown tail so that they don't come into contact with the hairs. It's not necessarily um, focused on tree health, which is why if when homeowners uh, call me and they, like most homeowners, are on a fixed budget um, if, and you, you can only afford to treat certain trees, focus on the ones that are right next to the house, overhanging the house. Um, don't worry too much about the woodlot next door. Um, it it will, will be fine in, in all likelihood. Um, but yeah, if, if money is tight, you know, focus on the trees and heavily, heavily trafficked areas. Uh, so one, one thing, uh, so tree removal is kind of a, a last resort, last option. Um, I always say it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Brown tail moth will not always be this bad. And hopefully, you know, your oak tree that has a lifespan of a couple of hundred years and will hopefully be here um, long after this outbreak uh, has ended. Um, you know, you got to look at the long, long view value of the tree, the shade it provides, the habitat, the food for wildlife, um, stuff like that. Um, but if uh, it is a good option, if the tree is, you know, in a, in the wrong place, uh, too close to the house or um, under power lines, um, poor form, in, in declining health, or um, you don't value the tree, um, it, it can be a one and done option, and we typically ask people to um, if they can wait until the winter um, to cut these trees down um, to do that because you'll be able to um, you'll basically be able to to clip the webs out on that fallen um, fallen tree and sort of have you know kill two birds with one stone um, also the ground is frozen in the winter or it's supposed to be frozen in the winter um, so the heavy equipment needed to take down some of these trees will have less of an impact um, as a side note. Okay, so another really important point that many people forget um, is to know your licensing requirements. Um, so the main board of pesticide control, uh, their motto is think first, spray last, which is, is very good advice. Um, so I have links here to licensing and certification, uh, pesticide laws, regulations and policies. Um, and there is special special requirements for treatment of schools and other public areas. Um, there are there are many chapters. Uh, I just highlighted these two in particular. Um, chapter 27 is standards for pesticide application uh, and public notification in schools. Um, and then chapter 28 is the notification for provisions for outside pesticide applications. Um, I see Allison put the uh, put the main board pesticide uh, website in the chat. Definitely check that out. A lot of great resources. Um, and then also 
uh, very importantly is do not use unlicensed individuals to perform uh, do-it-yourself treatments. Um, and then you're also going to want to make sure that if you do uh, whatever pesticide uh, you plan on applicating, if you uh, if you do go decide to go that route, is basically to double check to make sure that pesticide is registered in Maine, uh, and you can do that on the BPC website there. Uh, and with that, I will end and. Uh, either take questions now or I can wait until after Jeff is done talking. Yeah, let's move right on to Jeff because we're we're closing in on the last 10 minutes. So let's okay. uh, let's have Jeff go. Sounds Jeff good. Tarling, well, uh, yes. City Arbor, City of Portland. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Gary and Tom and uh, Allison. It's, you know, one of the biggest things that's helped us is the information sharing like today's forum. Um, we've been monitoring Round him off for a long time. I, I looked at some of the wreckage that go back to 1904, 1912, uh, where our first outbreak took place in Portland, as it did throughout much of New England. And at that time, we were clipping webs pretty substantially. Um, and actually, by the late teens, where you would get taxed if you didn't take care of your webs uh, and someone had to clip them for you. So when I, I was reading that, I don't know how they ever managed, but they, uh, that's one of the weird things they did do back then. And by the early 1930s, we started a little bit of a chemical control mixed with web clipping. It disappeared for a couple of decades on our records and showed up in the 90s uh, on Casco Bay Islands where um, access is really difficult. Uh, we did mostly aerial spraying there with some test spray. We used BT products and we ended up having pretty good luck. Uh, the one thing, as Tom mentioned earlier, that really helped us was we had some really wet springs and that population collapsed about the early 2000s. And then from then till about 2017, we were basically watching the communities north of Portland, the Falmouth, Freeport, Brunswick, um, and all the way up the coast as this progressed. And we would monitor uh, our sensitive areas where we had a lot of traffic and we had the right species and we would be down there clipping webs, say at East End Beach where the, we have a, a barge landing and then occasionally webs in some of the oak trees, but mostly it was mostly in the small ornamental trees at first. Um, I know in 2017 we found a few in Deering Oaks Park and it's a very popular park that's 52 acres um, right where the farmers market came in uh, every Saturday where there were thousands of people. And so we were hoping that it wouldn't progress. And then by 2019, we had enough to do some treatments. Mostly at that time, we were doing tree injections. Um, but it really, it really ramped up this last year. And um, we did survey work in January. Um, and much to our demand, as the oak leaves are slow to, to fall off, at first we thought most of those leaves were just foliage on there. And then we realized that they were brown tail. Um, I think one of the heaviest trees, we had 2,000 webs in it. So we started doing the math, realizing that with 2,000 webs in a tree, and we had hundreds of trees infected that we really had to come up with a program quickly. Um, and we shared the information with the public, our political body in Portland, the counselors and, and neighborhood groups. And uh, we came up with a plan to do uh, tree injections. We injected 72 trees. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, the trees were large diameter. We probably were right about a $200 per tree cost, um, but they were all really significant trees and mostly in the sensitive areas near playgrounds or near the uh, Deering Oaks Pond edge. Uh, in addition to that, we started that in April and uh, we, we did a survey, we mapped it. Uh, it was great having a survey, a, a GIS survey of all the trees. Um, so that the different applications, we could figure out where we were and didn't do duplication. All the trees were marked. And then um, in about the third week in May, we came in, um, we had Whitney Tree Service do a uh, mist blower, which was really effective. Um, I think we used in trust was that was the product we used. And the injections, I think we used uh, the Arbor Age uh, G4 product. And in all cases, for the most part, the tree injection worked pretty well. Um, we did have to cancel some of the events in the park. We still had a lot of caterpillars with those numbers. Um, 
one of the most significant trees that's on the big tree list of Maine, um, our pin oak, that they were roadway, so we didn't spray it, but we injected it. And uh, at that time, the uptake wasn't great. And so we had a lot of defoliation. Um, and anybody that's out of the communities or, you know, we have a local pesticide ordinance in Portland. Uh, so we're really sensitive about using chemical. We, we start off every year with uh, web clipping. Uh, horticulture and the forestry crews go out and we clip as many webs as we can find that we can get to. And, and we start that as soon as we can in January. Webs, I think this year, and you feel really good about it because you're eliminating those numbers. Um, so at the beginning, the public pressure is not to spray too much. And at the end, when there's too many caterpillars and you haven't sprayed enough. So you find yourself in that tough spot of getting criticized at the end that, hey, you should have sprayed some more. Uh, but I think we had a good approach. Again, um, working with the Maine Forest Service and kind of gauging where we wanted to do for a program and then communicating that program to the public uh, was mostly a really good results except for that one tree. And uh, even though everything else went well, uh, we did have some defoliation. Uh, most of it did recover. The, uh, the wet July, I think, really helped us this year because it helped get some foliage back on those trees. And so for the most part, you know, I, I think looking at the other communities, and I mentioned Falmouth, Freeport, and communities all the way up. I know Waterville's working on a program in Bangor as well. Sharing that information as we did with our Council of Governments in Portland and Cumberland County, was really a really important thing to do to share that we're not the only ones going through this issue because um, you kind of feel alone when you're trying to make these decisions uh, but it's, it's good results by uh, working with others and i appreciate uh, the time today just to chat about it so if anybody has any questions i'd be glad to, to answer those thanks jeff so we've only got about three minutes left i, I can stay longer if people need that but uh, Anybody have uh, specific questions for Jeff or for Tom? Are there any other municipalities or institutions that want to, you know, talk about what they've been doing? And Allison just posted another poll, which is, which of the following activities does your town or community group within your town participate in for brown tail moth response education web clipping insecticide treatment all of the above none of the above or i don't know I can't see the chat anymore. <laughs> you might have to click on chat. Sorry about that. I didn't want to um, leave without that. And just a reminder for folks that if you need licensed pesticide applicator credits, make sure you email your full name and pesticide license number to foresthealth at maine.gov. That's foresthealth at maine.gov. And also um, you can submit your poll answers there if you had trouble with the poll or like I said before by texting that phone number. All right, I don't, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. Did you want to mention the brown tail moth communication group? at this point <laughs> okay i the question there is a question where there are only two poll questions um and there was one initial one and then two others um so they were you know what's your role are you town manager other town employee presenter licensed pesticide applicator does your town have an emerald dashboard response plan and then this last one I will just add too that we did record this session and we'll post it on the website 
And in addition, I think um, we'll collate the resources that were listed in the chat and we can send everybody a follow up email with all of that information included. Yeah, and just to um, reiterate uh, for those of you that have pesticide licenses, you need to submit your full name and license number to forresthealth at maine.gov. Or you can also send in your responses by text to 949-5712. And we've got a, a, someone saying, I have some specific questions and requests for help with brown tail moth. Who should I email to make those requests? Uh, you can email me. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat here. Thanks, Tom. And thanks again to both Tom and Jeff. Uh, great job to give that great update. And with that, I don't know if we have anything else, but I think that's it. Well done, everybody. Thank you all for coming and to all our guest speakers. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks everybody.